implications for Asian security. Dr. Carver is a scholar in residence at the Government Department at Georgetown University, where he has taught since 1978, as well as being the founding director of its Asian Arms Control Project. He received his bachelor's in political science from Pepperdine College and his PhD in international law from Georgetown University, where he was a graduate fellow in the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He subsequently earned postdoctoral certificates from the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, the Wharton Business School at the University of Pennsylvania, and the Harvard Business School. A former U.S. Marine, in 1968, Dr. Carver was brought to Washington by Admiral R.A. Bush for, to serve as national security assistant to the ranking minority member of the Congressional Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. In the early 70s, he organized the JCS presentations to Congress on the Enhanced Radiation Warhead, co-authored the original dissuasion strategy, worked on the Secure Strategic Strike Plan, and served on Secretary of Defense Schlesinger's new alternatives project on selective nuclear options that had a major impact on U.S. targeting. Dr. Carver was the director of the presidentially mandated National Security Study Memorandum 186, the National Security Council of Interagency Studies, the multipurpose forces that became the Pentagon's standard assessment for NATO and the Warsaw Pact Force development trends for the end of the Cold War. In 1981, Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger recruited Carver to serve as the founding director of the Strategic Concepts Development Center, now the Institute for National Strategic Studies at the National Defense University, and designed it and designated him Secretary of Defense's strategy advisor, reporting directly to the Secretary and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. In the mid-80s, U.S. Ambassador to NATO David Abshire tasked Carver to organize and lead the first NATO net assessment for the alliance, and presented it to joint sessions of both NATO political and military committees. In 1986, Secretary of State George Shultz and Armed Control Negotiator Paul Hintze commissioned Carver to head the only study of a denuclearized world conducted for the President prior to the raid Kyabek summit. In the late 1980s, Carver served as an external advisor to British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, Secretary General of NATO Manfred Warner, and CEO of Ford Motor Red Poling. He has testified numerous times before the U.S. Congress and has appeared before many committees in Canada, Denmark, France, Germany, Sweden, and the, 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 the Netherlands. Secretary of Defense Frank Carlucci named Carver to the U.S. delegation of the Quadripartite Talks on Security in Asia at the personal invitation of the Deputy Chief of Staff of the People's Liberation Army. Carver lectured in Beijing on the impact of Sun Tzu and the formation of American competitive strategy. Dr. Carver's private industry experience is also quite extensive. For more than two decades, he was a senior executive with the BDM Corporation, where he headed the international division representing 6,000 overseas employees and businesses in over 20 countries. He was a member of the board of directors of Wireton Steel for seven years and chaired the New York Stock Exchange Listed Company's audit committee. Between 1997 and 2004, Dr. Carver served as chairman of the board of the JFK International Air Terminal, Terminal the international consortium led by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey to privatize, rebuild, and operate the Kennedy Airport International Arrivals Facility for 25 years, a project which was, in its time, the largest privatized terminal reconstruction in the world. In the post-9-11 financial collapse of the industry, Dr. Carver took over as CEO and was recognized by both the governor and mayor of New York for his leadership in saving the project. He has been an invitational speaker for the 1995 International Aviation Convention on Future Air Navigation Systems, the 1997 International Symposium on Transportation and the Environment, sponsored by the Transportation Ministry in Japan and at the request of the U.S. Secretary of Transportation at the 1999 Global Aviation Ministerial in Chicago, with representatives from 75 countries. His writings have appeared in two dozen books, and he has numerous articles published on topics of international security, the armed forces, China, Asian stability, and more. His book, Bad Men vs. Soft Law, A Century of International Aviation Insecurity, is due to be published this year. For the past year, he's been conducting research in Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, Borneo, and the Philippines for his next book, Strategicide, The Failure of Allied Planning for Defense of the First Island Chain, 1941 to 1942. The Jefferson Society is indeed honored to host such a distinguished individual this evening. Please stand and join me in welcoming Dr. Uh, I've played there many times, actually taking some silver. 
uh, and had just a wonderful time. I had at least three of my kids come up here in summers and, and uh, train uh, at your facility, so I'm an enormous fan of, uh, of UVA of Polo Team and UVA in, in the town of Charlottesville, which is a lot of fun. I think I know every skateboarding place in the town. <laughs> the uh, second big, big thrill is, is uh, I had uh, four years of debate in uh, college and three years, I had four years in high school, three years in college, and was a, a young cover reporter for CBS television in my earlier part of my existence. Uh, so I have an enormous uh, uh, value that I put play, personally place on, on the, the importance of uh, not only debate, but being able to present one's ideas. And, and uh, I, I love the uh, Philodemic Society of Georgetown. I have a feeling that I'm equally uh, equally uh, uh, high admiration for the Jefferson Society, so it's an enormous pleasure. Lastly, lastly, uh, I'm just the opening act for your debate tonight, so uh, I'm just trying to get you guys uh, warmed up, so thank you very much for coming. Uh, when when I, the Society asked me to talk, they uh, had seen some recent uh, discussions about some work that uh, my students had done, has achieved a little bit of uh, international notoriety, um, and they asked if I'd come up and provided a uh, talk on it. So um, this is a little bit of background. Uh, I'm just going to give you about four or five minutes of, of background and then um, show you some uh, video and then I think it be more fun after the video so I'll kind of open it up to a free flow. Not just keep, don't limit yourself to Q&A but uh, also offer your opinions or feel free to throw a, I prefer not real tomatoes but verbal rotten eggs is fine. Uh, it's just fun to sort of spar and, and mix it up a little bit. Um, this project, so we started the Asian Arms Control Project. Uh, uh, Professor Doug Shaw is now dean at George Washington University. And uh, he was, uh, uh, had been a uh, head of anti-proliferation in the Clinton administration of the Department of Energy. I had served as uh, uh, head of strategy in the uh, early Reagan administration in the Pentagon. Both of us had enormous personal belief in the value of rivals sitting down and talking to each other and trying to have some form of negotiated constraint. We thought that in the Cold War, the ability to have negotiated constraint, whether formal arms control or at least just good dialogue and understanding each other, had a major impact not only in ending the Cold War, but also making sure that the ending was smooth, rapid, and very peaceful. Having lived through a number of Cold War crises that got close to people initiating nuclear fire, having sat in the, uh, uh, participated in a U.S. national war game where, with the Secretary of Defense where we were playing our own military strategy to see how it worked or how it didn't, and watching close to 10,000 nuclear weapons be used and essentially ending reasonable life in the Northern Hemisphere in that game. I, I have a personal uh, uh, experience of being scared to death of these things, but also thinking that we need to take them very seriously and, and when rivals have them, we need to sit down, no matter how we dislike the rival for their policies, we still need to be able to sit down and talk to them. One of the things that so what Professor Shaw and I did, he was a little bit to the left of center, he was uh, with the uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility, I'm a little bit to the right of center. Um, and, uh, but we thought, the two of us both felt that arms control was extremely important. And since the end of the Cold War, the focus had been on proliferation, which is more of a policeman's attitude. It's more of a superior talking to inferiors and trying to keep them from doing something and joining the race. And it's a different approach as opposed to two rivals getting together and finding their own mutual interest in not building up arms. So we created the, uh, the Asian Arms Control Project because we saw the rise of China as raising the specter of a potential rival. They end up doing things in their own interest that may scare others in the neighborhood. We having allies and long-term commitment to the neighborhood may then try and react uh, do tilts towards Asia, and off we are running in an arms competition. Knowing how scary the 40 years of the U.S.-Soviet arms competition was, it seemed prudent that we ought to try to resurrect mutual negotiated constraint between potential rivals. And it would be smart if we could do the negotiations before we have the race, so that even if we can't stop everything, at least we can regulate it. There are fewer crises and less instability. Uh, so having seen the power at the end of an arms race, it's an open question whether anybody's smart enough to be able to apply it at the beginning of an arms race, but we thought it was worth a try. We thought it was important to have a new generation of students understand that arms control is important, 
that is multidisciplinary, that means you have very technical scientific engineering aspects, you have very legal aspects in terms of uh, normative uh, issues, and all kinds of policy from psychology, all of the social sciences. So it really is a multidisciplinary activity, but it also needs to be a professional activity. There are a set of, of norms and, and expectations about what serious arms control uh, analysis should be. And we felt that uh, there were very few places that was the, the, the modern generation generation seeding, succeeding us, were being trained. So we thought, well, we'd start at, at Georgetown. Uh, in the process of that, after we started a little while, I was on a defense committee, and uh, in the summer and spring of 2008, uh, China had a devastating earthquake, the Sichuan earthquake. And there were some reports uh, in China that uh, there had been either a nuclear weapon had gone off, or that uh, some of their tunnels where they had nuclear weapons stored had collapsed. And so the chairman of this panel asked, and knowing that I had a number of the students who had uh, Mandarin, and we had this Asian arms control project, hey, the fun thing would be to see if your students would like to take on a project and uh, uh, investigate uh, this to some open source basis and report back to the committee. So we started doing that. And after a few months, we came back and said, well, here's all we could find in the session one thing. It wasn't a lot. But one of the things we found is that China's building a lot of tunnels for their organization called the Second Artillery, which is their strategic rocket force. And these guys are building tunnels all over the place. And we, we tripped over some media <coughs> material with a bunch of articles. And, and, there's, and, and frankly, uh, most Americans don't seem to realize this. We showed it to the committee, and they, they thought it was really cool. So they kept asking us for more and more and stuff. So we went on for about a year. And then at the end of the year, in uh, fall of 2009, we were essentially ready to just kind of wrap things up. At 3 o'clock in the morning, I get a call from one of the students working on the project. And he goes, Doc, you wouldn't believe this, but we were just translating some, some articles. And the Chinese have publicly announced that they have 5,000 kilometers, 3,000 miles, of tunnels just for their missile forces and their nuclear weapons. By the way, my students don't mind calling in at 3 o'clock in the morning. It seems like it's important. Um, so we, uh, all of a sudden, it was like a, it was like a trans a transformative moment. Because up to that point, we were having fun, you know, looking, exploring. You know, you weren't sure what to make of it. And all of a sudden, you realize that you've been sitting in kind of an international secret that just got exposed. Um, so as a result of that work, um, it's received some degree of, uh, of attention. Um, and the nice part about it is the students have had a chance to, uh, to uh, brief their material. Uh, part of the team spent three hours with the uh, entire uh, professional staff at the Senate Armed Services Committee, who was the director. Uh, briefed several uh, places in the Pentagon uh, this last week. Uh, I've been on uh, uh, CNN, uh, uh, where else did they NBC, uh, Al Jazeera. Uh, and this last week, uh, they spent uh, uh, several hours with the uh, Under Secretary of State, uh, Rose Gottmi, who was our Under Secretary for Arms Control, uh, was really interested in the methodology that had been uh, used. And then yesterday, with uh, General uh, Kowalski, the three-star head of the Air Force at Global Strike Command. So it's been a fun run uh, in terms of stuff. One of the, I have sort of several observations from it. One is I believe that undergraduates uh, who were uh, in a good school, well-motivated, uh, and interested in a project can do fundamental basic research uh, that is equal of anybody in graduate school or even in scientific institutions. Uh, and I think we need to, my own personal bias is we need to uh, quit babying them uh, and, and, at, and have them uh, uh, have the opportunity, if they want, to take on research projects. Uh, and it's changed my own attitude. I just, I've taught as an adjunct since 1978, but it was only in the last six, seven years, of, or eight years I've been teaching undergrad. Uh, as most professors, I used to think, oh, you've got to be a graduate student to be a serious person. But what I found was how much I enjoyed the energy, excitement, innovation, and creativity of the undergrad. Uh, which I think, though, also pedagogically means that we need, we, those of us who are thinking about training the next generation, need to change our own attitude. And the professor's role, then, is not to sit there and throw out a bunch of stuff and have them regurgitate it back to you, and then sit there and sort of grade them. Rather, your role is to serve more as a mentor and say, OK, you know, pick a project, let's do some research, and let's try and make that, pro that research as best as possible. Uh, I've been enormously impressed with the work that uh, my guys have done, uh, guys and girls have done. Uh, a number of their papers are now passed around in the Pentagon. Uh, some of them got, we have people who are now uh, hired in uh, 
several intelligence agencies, the Office of Secretary of Defense, uh, White, who was a White House fellow, um, and a, a number of uh, research institutes. So it's, it's cool to see them be able to do that, and I, I feel more strongly about that than ever. Now, what I wanted to, to, to show tonight, is to, one of the things that we did with the Chinese research is we ended up doing, uh, collecting a, a, about 2.5 million English words of translated Chinese documents. If you, that's 4,500 pages, this being line about this. But another thing we found was, was China, China's internet is an enormous source of, of, of ability to, to find interesting things. China today is the world's largest internet user. Uh, it's growing like crazy. Uh, unlike the Russians to hide from Cold War, the Chinese love to talk. And they like to talk to each other. And when they're talking, they love to use the internet to talk to each other. And there's a very valuable way of, of being able to sort of see what they're looking and thinking. They have in, uh, embraced the, the video medium beyond anyone's wildest imaginations. It wasn't until we started getting this project, I've been I'm absolutely astonished. And not only their use of the video medium, but the quality of it. Um, it is literally world class now. So what, in the course of this project, we uh, downloaded over 200 hours of Chinese video. So the students put together, and we're trying to kind of capture what is it the Chinese, how do the Chinese view their own nuclear forces? Why did they go to this huge effort of building tunnels? And what we found is that that story was actually contained in a lot of video. So we put together this video. It, uh, I'll be showing it to you tonight, and I'm going to be narrating it. All the video you see is Chinese. There is no Western video. All the music you'll hear, which you won't hear very well from the back of my Mac, unfortunately, but you'll hear in the background. All of that is music associated with their missile forces called second artillery. And so we'll walk through and I'll basically show you. Think of it as in part, you're going to be surprised, I think, or, or, or you find it possibly interesting uh, about China and how they have put their, uh, built this huge tunnel complex to hide their missiles. And that's part of the story. And we titled this thing, uh, they titled the thing, the movie, uh, uh, China's Missiles Come Out of the Cave. And sort of the challenge for your generation of people who are interested in arms control is, OK, they've done this for their own interest, their own good. How do we keep this from turning into an arms race? How do we get the missiles essentially, if not done away with, at least reasonably constrained so that we're not off and running on an arms race? That's one aspect I would encourage you to think about looking at what you see. The second aspect is strategic culture. Uh, they are looking at the world. They, they came to the international scene differently than us. After Hiroshima, we were the top dogs in the world. So we come to multipolarity from being El Supremo. We know all the disadvantages of being the world's policeman. On the other hand, the Chinese come from a position of inferiority, of being <coughs> encircled, of feeling pressured. Um, they know that their term, terminology for deterrence is not like ours, sort of passive, kind of don't do anything bad, never, nothing bad to happen to you. Their, their concept of deterrence is very, very compelling, very forceful. Why? Because we and the Russians taught them that. So every time they would act up and we didn't like it, we'd have carriers running up and down. We'd put nuclear weapons in Taiwan. The Russians would shoot at them on across the Surrey River or build up missiles. So these guys have learned they came to this current world very differently through a different set of experiences. That doesn't mean they're right or wrong. It just means it would be smart if we at least are sort of appreciative of that. And our feeling is that showing how they view themselves um, is, is perhaps a useful way. So that's what I was going to do is show the, the video. I'll narrate as we go through. And I, I hope it's not, you know, find it uh, boring or uh, uh, less than uh, interesting for You might want to kill that overhead. At least this would be big. Okay. Is this blocking you guys? Is that better? So on the 11th of December, China publicly officially announced that they had uh, 3,000 miles of tunnels to hide their nuclear weapons and missiles. Uh, this is a compilation of film music only shown uh, from uh, Chinese sources. All the animation is theirs. They use the subtitle 
a study of strategic entropy because we think it captures kind of cinematographic study of strategic entropy. It captures our own American lack of knowledge and appreciation of how they sort of view the world. The film is going to start off showing you their first nuclear test. It was also the time they first started doing some digging some nuclear weapons, uh, digging some tunnels to store their stuff. What's interesting about this is you, this is not, they do not view nuclear weapons as just a deterrent to be thrown at somebody's city. They actually viewed it, even when they had only a few, as a war-fighting device. So watch this because it's, it's truly amazing to think that somebody has a relatively primitive army, access to nuclear weapons, and they put those two together in a very interesting and strange way. As a polo player, I find this well, exciting and, uh, <coughs> and obnoxious. These guys are going to fight the fire. This is the act. This is all Chinese documentary material from the actual uh, uh, exercise and, and test. This is their actual. Here's some of the guys going in with their original tunnels. This is their music, by the way, behind this uh, shot. This is their detonation device. Second row goes green, red. This is a 22 kiloton device that was about 30% larger than Nagasaki. Uh, uh, they were excited about it because it was a huge national achievement. Nobody believed they could do it on their own. The Russians had been helping them, then told them to go to hell. And so the idea that they could do it by their own was uh, a huge uh, challenge to do within five years. When we tested our nuclear weapons in Nevada, we set up a bomb and we had all our tro troops in defense in trenches. When they set theirs off, they decided to attack in the area of the bomb. So this next scene, now watch, this, this is a continuous shot, it's not edited. That's the bomb, and this is the cavalry attack into the drop zone. Is that cool or what? I love the horse. Look at the sabers! <laughs> because they were very weak, they emphasized building these narrow, they would take a deep ravine and dig holes at the side. This is a program that showed 24, and it was a, a docudrama series on Chinese TV with their leading uh, actors and actresses recreating very accurately the original uh, regiment set up to fire the first nuclear weapon. This is the opening credits you see every week when you sit down with your popcorn to watch uh, Chinese nuclear war. Um, and it's about this first regiment. And they get their weapon, they get tunnels. This is the opening credit shows every every week when you're starting to watch it. The hottest that actresses. <laughs> Their production quality is awesome. Remember, we've captured this off of the internet and TV, so it was a pretty high quality presentation. This film was produced and directed by a general in the 2nd Artillery, their rocket forces. Their rocket forces paid to have it done and it was accurate in every way possible. I showed the early. Uh, and it, remember, this is the opening credits, and at the end of the opening credits, every week, they're setting up a hydrogen bomb. This was shown in uh, 2008. This is a year 2000 civil defense documentary that gave us a lot of the really good historical uh, uh, period from Mao. When Mao and the Russians got into it, and, and they were, there was a point where the Russians came to us and said, we want to do a preemptive nuclear strike on China, and we will agree. Uh, and that's really what was the prelude to Kissinger going and Nixon going to uh, Beijing. Uh, we said no. Uh, but they were so scared, they were so weak. Mao said, okay, we gotta dig tunnels deep, store grain, and never never try to cause any problems. Uh, 
And they started manually digging these tunnels. They had over a million people in 30 cities digging tunnels at the same time. You would work eight hours a day, then you would go to a bus stop, and either a truck or a bus would pick you up, and then you would go and you'd see people, and they're actually in their civilian clothes, digging by hand, the huge number of casualties from, from tunnel cave-ins, literally digging thousands of linear feet of uh, tunnels uh, under the major cities to provide an air defense system. Just in Beijing alone, they have 300,000 citizens working on this project. This is a recreation to show the early conditions, but I'll show you then when it turns to actual uh, documentary footage. Huge complex, massive amount of concrete. It was an archaeological disaster because they took the old walls of Beijing and, and took them down and used the old, the, the hundred, the thousand year old walls uh, of Beijing to line the inside of the tunnel. So this is the old walls and they're using it now to line the tunnels. This, this is real footage, this is not a recreation. A lot of handwork, hand drills, no mass. There's the walls being reassembled, that's what it looks like inside. Just under Beijing, 30 kilometers of tunnels, so 20 miles covering 85 square kilometers. And they put uh, tanks, trucks, and uh, entire factories, hospital. Look at the size of these blast doors around the hospital, the lead doors. Enough food to last for several weeks. And you can move in and out of the city on these paths. You notice everybody's carrying their AK on their shoulder. Very liberated society. Women got to uh, dig tunnels along with the men. <laughs> Here's people that worked all day and now they just put four hours in for the uh, building of the tunnels. You'll see the shot a lot. They love this. They'll walk through and uh, the doors open. You see these little railroad tracks. You'll see them in, in all the tunnels. This is how they move stuff around uh, within the tunnels. Here's a, a cart. Here's Grandma putting together so she can go. <laughs> and so here's the buses coming in, we're driving through the tunnels. Like I said, 30 cities have been, have been done this way. And so the left, as you go through, watch. The development of the technology, this is a footage from Harbin, where they had about 10 kilometers of tunnels under the city. And this is back in Beijing. So the VIPs could drive right underneath Tindall Square or out to the uh, uh, headquarters outside, the uh, nuclear headquarters outside of town. Remember, this is a communist country, so virtually all investment is national. One third of their total national investment for a 10 year period was put into either digging tunnels or dispersing their industry out of fear of nuclear war. One third of every bit of investment was done for this job. This is what it looks like today. You can tour parts of it if you're, if you're Chinese, if you have a, a Chinese a citizenship card. If you're a foreigner, you're not allowed in. So the early missiles was called the DF-2, which is sort of like the um, uh, early Russian Scuds. Uh, were very, very crude. They were kept in these horizontal tunnels, pulled out, and then put on a, on a uh, trailer, and then raised fuel because they were liquid fuel. They had to be raised and fueled before being fired. This is an actual firing uh, countdown. We'll see this over and over, they love to show the scene. This next video, this is a modern video. And these these are two very pop, very popular pop singers. They must be the daughters of some general. Uh, but they have their own kind of TV show and, and, uh, and do their own music videos. And here they're singing, this is a modern pop song, singing to the glories of injured tun tunnelers uh, in the second artillery. 
And we used it as the background then to show you some of the historical stuff. These are the two of us here. So here's the early missiles. They're liquid fueled, so it's extremely volatile, so you can't keep them in. Once you fuel them, they're, and, and if you don't fire them, they're unusable. So you keep them horizontal in the tunnels, unfueled and without a nuclear weapon. Then in a crisis, you roll them out, move them vertical, fuel them, put the warhead on it, and then you would use it. That's very slow, very vulnerable. They were worried that the Soviets would preempt their two major reactors. So they built a secret reactor, Project 16. 21 kilometers of tunnels. And so this was a spare reactor. This reactor was to build nuclear weapons after the nuclear war, when, when your other plants have been destroyed, so you don't run out. They never turned it on because they didn't need to. We did not know this existed until four years ago when it went public. An interesting question is, how many more others are there like this? This is actually the diagram showing the 21 kilometers of tunnels. 700 people will be killed. There's a missile being shown. They're building that. There's a missile being pulled out of the tunnel. China tested its first hydrogen bomb in 1967. The difference was between 22 kilotons and 3 megatons. So it was almost uh, it was like 300 times the strength of the first one. By 1984, they built their first ICBM. It was basically it was built in three parts. The nose cone, the second stage, and the first stage. They only built a few of them. The beginning was liquid fuel, very vulnerable to attack. So I said, we got to put it underground. So we created a, a, a plan, a top secret plan, that we didn't know about until just a, a couple of years ago, uh, to start building tunnels to hide these missiles in. Between 1985 and 1995, they built uh, 2,500 tunnels. By the way, this guy is a, a brigadier general in the rocket forces. He's also the national opera star. So if you're a cool person in China, you can get a rank to help uh, the national cost. So here you see guys, they're still very perfect. Look at she's holding that drill with grease on his hand. It's a great way to get some The early tunnels have a lot of problems. You have water seepage and collapse. Very primitive. Lost a lot of people. The second artillery has the largest one of the largest hospitals in China, and its major specialty is, guess what? Lung cancer. Because so many of their guys were digging in the tunnels for so long, uh, they had a, a huge population of people with severe lung problems. Today, they're required to have uh, oxygen and mass. One of the problems you have is methane building. So one of the ways to do it, a Roman candle firing it down the, the tunnel to set off the methane so it doesn't build up. Now you can see this guy killed him in a second. The problem is it's hard to, to tell what, so you can get a, a true large method explosion that goes up. So they would bring Colonel Canary into the tunnels. And when he dropped dead, everybody goes, uh oh, we have a problem. <laughs> Major effort, all done in secret, but uh, relatively primitive. You see, the tunnels have sort of two parts. They did the rock out, and then they go, they a, re a rebar and, and uh, cantilever tunnel. This is what the first missile silos look like. This shows the uh, second missile they had, the DF 3, which would go about. Uh, 3,000 miles, cover most targets in Asia. And here he is moving through these blast doors in the tunnels. And you notice they're moving around with these little rails. You'll see that over and over. This film was just released recently after I showed the photo. Perspective is you 
don't know what's in the tunnels or how much is there. When missiles are first in production, you can say, okay, well, they can only produce between five and ten a year. But when a missile's been in production for 30 years, the span of possibility of how many that can be is very large. Generally, uncertainty produces uh, concern. People then react to that uncertainty. So generally, an arms control, having stuff hidden, may be good in the short term, but it often provokes others to respond. So again, you see very primitive. What they found when they, if they moved them very far, on the rough terrain, the gyros would be great. Now, the missile didn't work very well, so they found they couldn't move them very far with the first generation stuff. So it was a workable system for a poor guy, but it wasn't very sophisticated. They love this. One minute he's in a uniform, now he's in khaki. And of course they got one through this This is another program produced by Second Artillery called Missile Brigadier. It's a life, a year in the life of a uh, uh, guy who takes over a new missile unit, getting new technology. Again, these are the opening credits. So you're walking, you know, you're sitting down, getting ready, you have to be ready to watch some movies. And this is the first 30 seconds of opening credits. You see a missile being launched. You see uh, satellite uh, coverage. Missile launch computer. And of course, no good opening credit is worth anything without having a reentry vehicle land on the opponent and blow up. Uh, they talk a lot about the Taiwan crisis in 95 96, where they announced areas that they were going to, they were trying to put pressure on Taiwan to not uh, uh, vote for a, uh, an anti communist party. So they announced these zones where they were going to be testing their missiles in and around Taiwan. The, uh, Series Brigadier basically describes that now as a modern, a new one in the 19, post 2000 crisis, showing uh, a conflict with the United States over Taiwan. So here's their Central Military uh, Committee, that do their like their National Security Council, and sort of our JCS combined. And they go, okay, there's a crisis, and they order the forces out of the tunnels. Those are BF 21s, the new ones that are. Uh, called the anti-carrier missile. So, when you have an alert, you warn the guys who are in the tunnels, they get their missiles ready. Now these, are, these new missiles are solid fuels. So you don't have to fuel them. They have solid state electronics. You load these, these are actual real film. This is not uh, documentary stuff. Of guys running through the tunnels, here's a, a missile, someone coming through. And this isn't just randomly go out. The whole thing is orchestrated to have certain units go out to firing positions, put decoys up, and after the fire, you go into another tunnel set, rearm, reload, constitute your unit, and go out and do it again. Very interesting. This shows the tunnel, these very rare shots, double blast doors. You get yourself a little railing. part of the 
this is not that they have these missiles, but they have an operational concept designed for a crisis. Some of these missiles would be used conventionally. The problem is if you're on the receiving end, when they're coming in, you don't know whether they're going to be conventional or not. If you're somebody trying to protect an ally, it's even uh, equally scary. <laughs> And that's what's, what's why I think it's a major arms control issue, is to have what's called crisis stability at least, so that uh, people don't get carried away.
These are ICBMs coming out of their position. You notice that they're really long, but the front and the back wheels turn separately so they can make extremely sharp turns.
square miles. Uh, that, that was essentially, you could take the blueprints and blanket the entire city of uh, Beijing or Washington inside the, the beltway with those same blueprints, according to them. Again, a heavy emphasis on, on deception, noise, and camouflage.
Jonathan Escalas here uh, is our uh, webmaster for the uh, Asian Arms Control Project. And he put this on, uh, we have a website, he put this on the video. Then a, a smaller version of this though has been shown on YouTube on five or six different places, the sum of which is close to 100,000. In terms of some thumbs up, thumbs down on YouTube, it's about two thirds thumbs up, about one third thumbs down. Then somebody posted it in China on Niku, their YouTube, and it has 84% approval rating and only 16% negative. So we're twice as we're, we're twice as least popular in China as we are. <laughs> now again, notice the quality of the construction. The old tunnels that didn't have the air conditioning. Here's one of uh, a gallery where they'll bring in a missile and a trailer with Reload, have the gas move it from one to the other, reload it. Look at the size of these tunnels. They showed this, and I still don't know what they mean by it. This, they did this when they were highlighting the uh, tunnels opposite India uh, in Tibet. Two sides, cool. You see the little railroads. They put in these command control centers to monitor the top construction. <coughs> then after the construction, those become the command and control centers for the missile forces that are in the tunnels. So you can organize and coordinate the uh, forces. So in December 2009, they complete the next phase two, or excuse me, phase three of the tunnels. Uh, and they're really proud of themselves. And that now gives them 5,000 kilometers of tunnels. And this is the way they look at the bleeding. And then this is the way they reported the story as a republic. In Hong Kong, there's this really great show. I, watch, I try to watch it every week, a place a few times a week. And this guy wrote the best-selling book uh, analyzing the Gulf War. But he draws his other camo. He's got his high-tech site. He interviews generals and shows all the latest film. And the way he starts this way, he always starts off with a, with a newspaper article, and then he'll go in and show, and, and the PLA will release some of their latest video uh, to him. So it's a great place to check and see what's going on in China. So they're all excited. Hey, this is really cool. Now we can compete with the United States. Uh, some of the headlines, Taiwan, shivers, in fear. It was funny, the United States didn't notice this until our team did this analysis in the public, in a public way. But, but even though nobody in the United States paid attention, the Chinese would go, the Americans are, are afraid of our new missiles. So it's really important to them, at least internally, to sort of stress the importance. So the new tunnels now, you've got uh, military exercises going on. These are the new missiles going through the tunnels. won a national contest to sing the song China Goose with a badge on her shoulder, second artillery. She beat out in that contest uh, uh, China's most, most popular opera singers. They're, they're clearly proud of what they've done. And they, they, it's, a, it's a major national feat. It took a huge amount of, of stuff. Our rough cap, we have some, some evidence on manpower and, and data. At a minimum, we think it took 50,000 men a year building these tunnels for the last 25 years. And it costs something like, in US terms, $50 billion. We saw some, some of their articles talking about, hey, you can see our missile sites from space. So our guys went to Google Earth, and sure enough, we built this valley and seeing all these tunnels. When our report came out, the uh, uh, Federation of American Science said, oh, well, these missiles could come out of there. And actually, uh, they were wrong. They can. This is a video showing how the missiles come out. Chinese video showing how the missiles come out and our, uh, our 
our style mode. These are ICBMs in the United States. Some colonel says, this is a, this is a national uh, disgrace. 
is showing national secrets on TV. Some local reporter that films half a sergeant uh, doing the switching of one of these uh, missile drones. This is the uh, Ukrainian design, and you actually look at it, it's actually being built in China. Here you see the, how the missiles slide into the car, and these doors open, the cars are disguised as civilian vehicles. And then being built in China. This is the launch position, which looks almost identical to that of the OMSS 24. There's a debate right now in the U.S. government about whether these missiles, are, these trains are just moving to move the missiles or actually launch them. This is a shed that goes into a tunnel complex where the rail trains are hidden. And then this is actually their scene showing the train coming out. And the students had fun with this evening. missiles. So we took out all of our tactical nuclear weapons from Asia. 
and all of our medium missiles, including the stuff on submarines. The United States today has no missiles other than some, a few uh, uh, Aegis uh, air defense missiles. No missile division or nuclear weapon. If there was a crisis and you had to move to try to get some tactical uh, nuclear weapons, you'd actually have to bring them from Europe to the continent of the United States. And we still have a large force of you know, ICBMs in the United States, but the old, the old idea of, uh, that we worked in Europe of having a nuclear force forward to keep things stable, which had its own problems, but nonetheless, that essentially is gone. So there's a huge vacuum in Asia right now. Uh, in 1995, the Chinese had uh, 150, 200 missiles uh, that could be used in and around Asia. Today it's 1,700, and we have zero. So one of the major pressures that we and the Russians are going to face is, are we going to stay in the INF Treaty, in which we've literally taken out all these systems? So we're either going to have to get the Chinese in, or we're going to have to get out at some point if this buildup continues. You just can't. You just can't. Do that. Uh, even if we didn't care about our allies, the Russians are right next door and they're not going to put up. Well, they said they're not going to put up. So it's going to be a really interesting challenge. People say, well, the Chinese aren't interested in arms control. And yet they signed one of the biggest arms control agreements most people don't even know about between them and Russia to demilitarize the border. So they have done it when it's in their interest. They pretend like they're, they're not interested. But when you sit down and have a serious discussion with them, I think they, they say, guys, we, this isn't a matter of please, it's a matter of options. Do you want us to respond? Because it won't just be us, it'll be the Russians. Or do we want to try and you want to join us and try and get rid of this stuff? So we're going to have, I think, we're going to need to have some very serious discussions with you on that issue. A second issue is the buildup of ICBMs and the rail base, which is mobile. We spent a decade trying to get rid of those because they're extremely bad for arms control. Because they're mobile and they're hidden, so you don't know how many he has. And it's very, and he's not going to let you, or doesn't want you to go in his tunnels, because once you go in his tunnels, then you can get his target at the entrances. So it's, if, if arms control is best when both sides are have a good idea of what each other has, it's not so good when somebody, even if a smaller country, is in the process of suddenly adding a, a larger number. So again, we're going to have to challenge them. Then the last big, so that's the second big issue, is, is we and they are going to have to have a serious discussion about, okay, and we, we and frankly in the United States are going to have to decide, and it's, it's probably going to happen in the next couple of years, do we, right today, we and the Russians hold each other mutually vulnerable. That is, we can destroy Russian civilization and they can destroy the United States. There's no other country that can, has that level of power against the United States. Today, China might be able to hit us with about 20 weapons. By 2020, given what we see in both the putting MIRVs, that is multiple warheads on, on missiles, so each missile doesn't fire one warhead, they fire anywhere from three to ten, and putting them on railroad, there's the potential of some substantial breakout. So I don't think it's you don't have to be a threat monger to say, you know, it's going to be close to 100 cities soon. So we as a society got to decide. Do we want China to hold us vulnerable? And if so, okay. If not, then are we going to try and negotiate with them to keep them from building up, or are we going to build some kind of, of, of defense? And it's going to be some very tough choices for us. One of the things that seems to be pushing them, and again, you don't have to demonize China. One of the things I do is I take a, a, a quote, and the quote says one something like this. Uh, uh, we are, uh, our strategic interest is in, uh, uh, see, the quote is, uh, everyone at, at Harvard uh, is uh, interested in, uh, I'm sorry, uh, everyone at, uh, every good communist is interested in keeping the American imperialists from being present in Asia and intervening in Asian affairs and causing problems. That quote is actually from Theodore Roosevelt, and all I did is change Communist Party, from Lord Harvard to Communist Party, and the, the European to American and Latin American and Asian. So, and I think that captures their, their attitude, which is Asia is for Asians and you shouldn't be out. There is almost a Chinese Monroe doctrine, if you will. And the reason I stress Monroe is so we don't necessarily demonize them, because we have that attitude. So, just because we had it doesn't mean necessarily they should, but it's not also uh, immoral that they would have 
have a very similar uh, attitude. And they, as they're rising, they seem that seems to be sort of their game plan, which is, you know, other we well, one of our admirals was meeting with a Chinese admiral, I think it was about two years ago, and, uh, they, and we were trying to get the Japanese and the Chinese to have these anti-piracy patrols, which they are doing. And it was said, gee, we'd like to uh, uh, have you help us secure the Pacific. And the, uh, the admiral said, yeah, no problem. Why don't you why don't you preserve the Pacific from Pearl Harbor East, and we'll preserve the Pacific from Pearl Harbor to China. You can have your eastern lake and we'll do the western. I mean, that seems to be where their, 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 their foreign policy interest is going. It doesn't mean they want a war or even want to invade anybody. So what's interesting is this buildup that it seems to have several phases to it. One phase is having what's called dominance in the local region. So they can keep our aircraft carriers out or hit our air bases if we send aircraft in. And the other is to make sure that we're not interested in intervening by saying, hey, this ain't a free ride. You start intervening in, in, in Asia and it gets out of control. It's not just Chinese cities and it burns to the Americans. So we as a country are going to face a, a dilemma of how we want to respond to that. Uh, and I think it's going to be a very careful, in my opinion, it's going to be a very careful tread. It needs a high degree of professionalism. I don't think we should demonize them. I don't think we should turn this into a anti-Chinese crusade. Uh, but it means we ought to have some, some very realistic negotiations. It goes to the heart uh, of the President's uh, Prague address in the uh, beginning of his administration uh, uh, when he called for a world without nuclear weapons. As your introducer noted, I did the first study for uh, Secretary Schultz prior to President Reagan going to Reykjavik and propo proposing that idea with uh, Gorbachev. It was, would have, I came out and said, it's possible, this is uh, 86, it's possible. But challenging, and you're going to have to, you can't go down to, to low and not have very, very intrusive verification. Today it's two or three, four times harder. And when somebody puts their forces in an underground tunnel complex, it becomes all, how would you monitor that? I mean, just raise up some <laughs> fundamental questions. And if they're doing it to safeguard their security, they don't want your guys walking in with a GPS I, I, iPhone and saying, oh, I know where this is now. So how, how would you do that? How would you be able to simultaneously know it's in 3,000 miles of tunnels? And at the same time, be able to, to uh, have them still feel secure. It's a really challenge. So I, I think we face three very serious arms control problems. An INF treaty getting them in, having some very serious talks about ICBMs, and deciding ourselves whether we want to be vulnerable to China. And if China, do we want to be vulnerable to, to India, which is working on an ICBM, or even to an Israel, which is working on an intercontinental missile. God knows why. Okay, so this is not going to be the last time we're going to face this issue. And then the last point is, is we're going to have to have some very, I don't like the idea of turning to my grandkids and say, you know, well, Grandpa kind of screwed it up, and, and uh, you guys are going to be living in a lot dirtier world than I was. Uh, but that's the reality, and that's going to be the challenge that, for your generation. Uh, and I think it's going to take a very careful balance between uh, tough realism and a constructive approach to try to, uh, uh, to look at it and work together with the uh, potential rival. Anybody have a question? Uh, I'm going to go back. Thank you for the talk. Um, so I've heard a lot about uh, issues in cybersecurity. Yes. And the Americans are, yes, us Americans are behind in countries like China and Iran in terms of cybersecurity. Is that more of an issue or is this one an issue, considering that we're so dependent on it? Yeah. Um, <coughs> Cyber is a challenge, and one of the challenges is when you use it offensively, you don't know whether it's going to work until you try to use it. So it's a very difficult, it's kind of like biological warfare. It's been around for a long time. People actually develop biological weapons, but even military guys didn't want to use it because they didn't know what the consequences were going to be. It was so unpredictable. Uh, don't quote me that cyber warfare is the new biological warfare. But, but it, it, yeah, I'm trying to illustrate the, the, the problem of, of uncertainty makes it a very weird weapon. And so you, you're not sure whether there's a lot of hype or whether you can actually decapitate somebody and take them out. Uh, so I think it's a serious issue. And it ought to have, you know, we ought to be defending ourselves. We are probably more vulnerable than uh, some societies. Uh, because we tend to be more open, uh, we have more open architectures, uh, we've been slow to create an organized deal. 
But other guys have problems too. I mean, the students were, my guys were, uh, the gals were, uh, uh, we do these string searches. And so the Second Artillery has a website. You go there and it says, hello, hi, how are you? And if you don't have the password, you can't get past the homepage. We were doing some string searches, and next thing we knew, we were came in the back door, and we, you could, we downloaded their uh, their uh, uh, syllabus for their uh, artillery forces. Uh, we got the uh, the SAT scores if you wanted for the officer school. Uh, so they had it. now Beijing is very hard, but as you get out into the regions, China itself is not as hard. We were doing what I call offensives, and we just have to fall into that place. Uh, but it was kind of cool. Um, so I, I think the uh, uh, cyber is a, a certain issue. On the other hand, you hit something and you hit a, a uh, let's say the target of uh, our electrical plants with the cyber. And they take down a significant part of the American electrical grid. But within four or five days, it's back and running. Now, if it's part of a war, that could help be decisive. But if it's just, just sort of a retaliatory issue, okay, people are inconvenienced, you know, so. We looked at, uh, at, at what happens if, with their, their missile buildup, if they build birds on their ICBMs and targeted them just small, relatively small warheads, Hiroshima-sized warheads, at American nuclear and large electrical plants, 300 large electrical plants in the United States, you kill half the American population. Not because of the nuclear weapons, but because the United States cannot, most Americans cannot live without electricity. When, when electricity goes, you know, 100 years ago, people would go out, they knew how to gut a deer or maybe eat Fido or whatever. Uh, three days after the electricity's gone, there isn't going to be any stores, there's not going to be any transportation. I mean, our society basically, you take out our electrical grid. So my point is not to be scary, but nuclear weapons have a physical effect. And I'm not even talking about killing people, I'm talking about even just in, 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 in societal disruption that is orders of magnitude about what, about what happens with cyber. And so I'm trying to say that without diminishing the cyber issue, but nukes really are scary. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, my name is Ben Donahue, and thank you for coming back. Sure. But, uh, so given that this is public, this video, yeah. and I remember your introduction, you did something with Sun Tzu, Yes. What, to what extent do you think that these videos are a deception? Either are, are, are what are a deception, either for underestimating the strategic capability or overestimating the strategic capability. I, I mean, I don't know the, the background the details, yeah. but it feels as if these could be some sort of a deception. Either way. They could. The short answer is I don't know. Um, some things to think about. Almost all of that, I would say 97% of that, was for domestic consumption. So I would argue that this is not an, if they were, if they're trying to send a message, either they got too much or they got too little, or whatever the message is, whatever the target audience is, I don't think that those were oriented outside of China. I think they were oriented domestically. So then the interesting question is, okay, why are you getting your own society pumped up? Very, hey, it's expensive, uh, so you're paying taxpayers' money. We'd like you to appreciate the second artillery. We did the same thing. If you were back in the 50s, we had uh, Strategic Air Command, had uh, uh, Gary Cooper and Sack Strike, and you know, you had all these cool ones, and, and, and the Air Force basically subsidized. But if you watch Dr. Strangelove, the operational pieces in not, not the silly part of the war, the war room, no, it's the war room you can't fight here. <laughs> but, but the operational stuff about uh, on the plane and the alert system was extremely accurate. So, and, and had Air Force support, which we were very sorry for after the after Cooper came out with it. But, so we used to have that same kind of promotional stuff. Part of it is just basic pride, I think. Um, part of it is in a civilian society where the military is not as cool creating a sense of elitism like you see with second artillery. I mean, those, those guys are, are tough, they're they consider elite, and, and pumping them up as a national field to get people, you know, guys in, in university, girls in, in university, to go and, and join the second artillery. Um, the, uh, uh, might be part of it. We know they've been digging a lot of tunnels. Uh, and that part is real. Um, 
this is. I don't think there's a debate in the U.S. national security community that they've built a lot of tunnels and that some of that might add up to, for the military, numbers that we're, we've talked about, 3,000 miles. I think the debate is, 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 is it, was that tunnel complex designed for second artillery and to hide nuclear weapons, and does it have the operational aspects of doing this pulse, going out firing conventional, go back in, and doing war fighting? And there's, a, there's an honest debate going on in the government, I think, about that. And, there, and you know, major money takes your choice. Um, so we looked at these and we go, looks like war fighting to us, you know. But um, people come back and say, well, after all, it was just a big, or some of that was just a big for TV docudrama. Some of it was sort of military hype and, and so forth. I think when you look at their military literature, we were able to, to get a number, like I said, we had 4,500 pages of stuff, and we had uh, one, several of their major manuals, like uh, the Science of Second Artillery, which uh, Science of Second Artillery campaigns, which is a, you know, which a 2000, Nick, what is it, 2004? Yeah. Um, Nick Iacono is one of my lead uh, guys. He's a, literally an expert on uh, Second Artillery. Um, the, the, uh, we had this man, this man was top secret in China, and we were able to get a copy, and, uh, and, we, and we had it translated. Um, 400 pages, and it lays out three types of campaigns. A conventional missile campaign, like you saw here with this pulse, and, that, and they describe coming out of the tunnels and how to fire and go back in. Then they have a thing called a deterrence campaign. And a deterrence campaign is when you're trying to impress the opponent in a crisis. So you're not actually doing this stuff to use it, but you're trying to scare the crud out of it and get him to back down. And you can do that in a in the crisis before conflict starts, or you can do that in the conventional crisis just before going, it goes nuclear, to try and free, keep him from going nuclear. And then they're giving a lot of thought to that. And then the third one was the retaliatory campaign against uh, an enemy's homeland. So they're training their, I think it is fair to say, they're training their guys how to do what we saw in those films. And if you look at uh, Chinese military thought, uh, their major journals, that's very consistent with, with what they're doing. On the other hand, a deterrence campaign would be very logical to hype some of this stuff even now. So, again, I, I'm amazed at our popularity there. <laughs> that's weird. But that's, that's my, that's, yeah, I'm sorry. If we're, uh, Thank you very much. Simulations that are a lot of fun. We have some of our star simulation people here. I thought it would be really cool if some of you would like to go and, and actually blow up the world and see what it's like to, uh, to do a, some of these military simulations. We have a Georgetown uh, UVA uh, set of exchanges to work. We'd like to have you uh, an open invitation over the next couple of years to uh, actually create a, a, a simulation society with you guys between Philadelphia and Texas. Thank you very much. We can our role when you guess. Thank you very much.